Hey everyone, my name is Keshav and I'm the producer for this episode. Today's conversation is with Elena Kim, who is a CPA, business advisor, accounting instructor, and former Ernst & Young manager. She also happens to be a former colleague of Sam's at EY, and they more recently crossed paths again at the CPA Western School of Business, where they are both instructors. And Elena really joined Sam to discuss her life as now an independent consultant and how her career has progressed through time since beginning out of school. Uh, and they also shared some thoughts on the future of the CPA profession, among much more. Elena also recommended two books uh, to students, and I would probably extend that as well to recent grads um, in her conversation with Sam. I've linked uh, those in the description, so you can check those out if you like, and also Elena's contact info in the description. Thanks very much and enjoy this episode. Hello, Miss Elena Kim. Oh, hi, Sam. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> hi, Sam. <laughs> so very important question that we're going to kick off with. When eating burgers and fries, what is your order of operations? Oh, that's mm -hmm. a tough one. Uh, I asked the tough questions. <laughs> um, I usually start with fries. I have to eat one thing at a time. I don't mix things around. So I have to eat fries first. Okay. And then I eat my burger and then I have a, my drink. So that's kind of my order. Oh, so there's <laughs> not even mixing of food and drink. Well, yeah, if I get really thirsty, but I, I like to finish one thing at a time. So <laughs> oh, fascinating. I really like that. Um, and do you, I'm just so curious now, do you find that that's how you like to work? You like to focus on one thing at a time? Yeah, I mean, I do multitask as a accountant. I think you have to multitask because there's mm -hmm. so many different deadlines. But yeah, I, I like to uh, finish one thing and move on and like to check things off. And otherwise, I think about it. And yes. uh, so I like to kind of move things on. And, and, and once you move on, you don't think about it. So it's a very good point. And I think I'm learning a lot already because I eat my burgers and fries and drinks like, <laughs> like I go back and forth, back and forth. And and I work like that. And it's not necessarily the most um, productive and effective, uh, but I definitely have the best time doing it. So I think I'm going to try your way, um, especially with a few upcoming projects. So thank you. I, I never quite made the connection, <laughs> but, but here we are sharing, uh, sharing my uh, therapy session, my work therapy session to the world. Fabulous. All right. So Elena, uh, how do we know each other? It's funny. I know that was kind of the first question. And yeah. uh, I was looking back and uh, I don't know if you recall, but I was teaching a tutorial as a TA, I think my first time at the University of Calgary. And I think you're in one of my tutorials. Um, <laughs> so I remember seeing you then. Um, yeah. And and I remembered you because I think we actually had a chat because I think you really wanted to do well in the class and um, <laughs> and and I'm not sure you were that keen about accounting but I mean I saw <laughs> but you know everyone in the intro level have a hard time I think with accounting because it's such a it's not natural I find because the debits mm -hmm. and credits are man-made it's it's something that you have all you have all these rules and um, things to follow and then I remember you at EY because um, oh, I hold, hold on hold on I just want to go back because I was scared like I was so scared in intro because the very first class we had a CA teach and she said, look to your left, look to your right. One of you won't be here in three months. <laughs> so yeah, it worked. And I, I definitely was like a good little like student soldier and I wanted to get the most out of it. So absolutely. Um, I didn't know if I was good enough to be there, quite frankly. I didn't know if I had the skills. So um, I definitely wanted to be, I took accounting in high school and really liked it and like numbers. Um, but I was intimidated. Uh, I was intimidated. So, um, like, thank you for being one of, um, one of the few resources to help me feel like I belonged and I could definitely do it. So, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. I mean, I, I never asked, but I know you really wanted to do well, but yeah, I guess like, yeah, I could tell that you, you're kind of timid and not sure that, this was, you know, and a lot nice. of students feel that way. I'm, I'm quite surprised that someone's <laughs> instructor or prof said that that's very important. Right? 
Yeah. And we'll get into like what we're both doing now, but it is really funny knowing what we know now that somebody would say that to like a room full of, I don't know, like 18, 19 year olds. And just, you know, cause there's a lot of trauma that goes on there. Um, just naturally being kind of in that new environment. Okay. Sorry. And then, um, so from university, like do, 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 went in the time machine and poof, we were at EY. Yeah, because I uh, article, I did my co-op term um, at the university, um, and at EY was one of the placements I did. So, of course, I naturally went there after graduation, and I think you were there, I'm not sure if it was a summer student or, uh, like, one of the intern positions, right? And then you joined full-time. Yeah, yeah. So, really good memory. I was an intern, um, and I did a placement first in M&A. And then I was supposed to be one month and then I stayed in M&A and then I started back early in M&A. And then, uh, so I had about eight months experience before I joined audit. So I kind of had this choice of, do you stay in M&A and continue in eight months as a junior, or do you, do you go into audit and then have a, have to be thrown in the deep end? And I was like, I like the people. I like what I'm doing. Uh, audit will be there. And I'm really glad that I took the time um, because I didn't always uh, to fully see through um, an opportunity versus trying to kind of like ladder up as quickly as possible. So I made a lot of mm, decisions for the wrong reasons earlier on, but that was one of the decisions that I'm, I'm relatively proud of, like not going for that, like promo so early on so that's probably why you're kind of like hmm, were you there were you not I'm like I was there I was around but I didn't kind of start back at EY um until yeah it would have been a, a little bit later in audit and so when I started the staff I feel like you were probably at the senior level yeah yeah so I took the typical path of uh, joining the audit I did rotation to get my tax hours in uh in tax um but yeah I was in the audit just kind of went through the normal path and yeah so I remember seeing you uh, but we never really worked in the same job or anything uh but yeah I was uh, I was glad to see you but surprised because I know I because last time I interacted with you you weren't sure but I didn't know about accounting but then you yeah took that um, uh, transition, I guess, to really get into accounting. So that was fantastic. But, you know, I was just trying to survive in the firm. So I didn't really have luxury to um, really uh, get into mentorship or really getting to know people. When I look back in my articling days, I just lack of sleep and (laughs) no low life, really just working all the time. So yeah, no, completely. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny going down memory net road. And I know that, uh, and we'll get there because linear is overdone, but I don't know if you know this, I was actually mentored by your husband at the firm. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So he was my <laughs> like official, uh, he was my manager and <laughs> at Christmas, this is so embarrassing at Christmas, everybody was buying their manager's presents. And I was like, that's really weird. I'm like, I don't know what to get. Cause like, like your husband's name is also Eric. And I was like, I don't know what to get Eric. And I was like, I feel like he wouldn't want me to get him anything. So I ended up getting him. Um, and I still remember this because it's so cringy. I got him, um, I donated an animal to um, some, some, like a, to one of those, you know, where you buy either a goat or something <laughs> to, um, to donate to a family to like raise the goat and like milk the goat and stuff. And I remember <laughs> got an email and I think I got a reply from him like thank you for the Christmas goat <laughs> so, yeah. oh, wow. oh. it's a small world it's a really small world but um I don't expect you or him to remember because um yeah it was it was so long ago <laughs> I'll have to really ask him about that <laughs> no, I, I'll have to ask him about that uh <laughs> that, that, I'm not sure how he would not remember that. I don't think you would get a gift like that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> not every day that your junior is like, here's a goat. Um, so yeah, uh, that's because it's a small, yeah. So we're at the firm and it's very easy we're at the firm EY and Calgary to go months without, I don't know, seeing anybody that's not on your team. And like you were saying, you were focusing on surviving. I was focusing on surviving and yeah, somehow we're sitting here uh, several, several years later. Um, so 
did you stay because students here a lot of them are just getting their job offers or for next year and a lot of them are kind of curious they're like hmm, we want to peek under this like under this hood of like the firm and a lot of people are saying did I make the right decision some people don't have offers and are are upset some people have offers and aren't sure if they want to take them so I figured this conversation is well timed um, because of both of where we came from and both where we are and we get along um, and have very similar kind of um, pedagogical views. So um, you're at a firm, you are senior. What, what's the next steps from there? Did you stay till partner? Did you live the dream? <laughs> you know, I think when you go to the firm, you really drink that Kool-Aid, right? Uh, you want to make it to the partner. That's a dream. Cause you get really wowed and um, wine and dine per se uh, to see what kind of lifestyle they can have. And for sure, I, you know, when I started, uh, you know, I definitely wanted to stay, uh, when I first joined the firm, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be a partner and kind of live the dream, I guess. And, and while I went through the path, um, you really realize that um, just how precious time is, because all my time, um, I, I, kind of did very intense uh, way. I did my whole CASB or the CPA PEP program uh, equivalent uh, in a year. Oh, you um, fast tracked while I fast- firm. Yeah, because I, I wanted to be promoted faster, right? Because like, when you're in your early 20s, I'm sure your um, students can relate. You're like, you want everything to be done faster. You want it yeah. done yesterday. And, you, and you're competing against your peers a lot. So you really get into the mindset of surviving and competing and trying to be, try to uh, outwit, uh, I don't want to use a survival. So yeah. <laughs> outwit, outlast everyone. Um so yeah, I, I you know I once I made manager, you know you go to uh, at EY, you went to Florida for manager training across the whole North America. You really get really I was wowed, right? In terms of that, um, oh, but so that you, kept the Kool Aid coming. Like that was yeah, like the next. That was like spiking the Kool Aid. You were like, give me okay. Yeah, because you know I think now the CPA yeah. with um, it really opened up. So experiences are wider. But if you go to a firm. When you're 20 some year old and you make manager, you're making six figures. You really get into that. Uh, you see a different world. I mean, my par- you know, I immigrate here with my parents, uh, with my sister, um, like 30 years ago, and my parents weren't really well off. So making that kind of money at that age, you really you really get into it. And um, because, you know, when you're a poor student trying to just (laughs) live day day after day, um, seeing that you really like, oh, this is a really good lifestyle. Um, But then, as you mentioned, I I got married and when I was a manager um, there at EY and you kind of see other um, life you want, not just working all the time. And, you know, I pretty much lost a lot of my friends um, from university in my childhood because I was working all the time for that um, few years. So I wanted to have more work-life balance because um, that was a big thing then. It's like, oh, work-life balance, you want to work. And they thought it was like a millennial thing that <laughs> this year. Well, I, just, I laugh because I think EY um, was voted, uh, <laughs> like they won some workplace, like, like work-life balance awards like year after year. And I was working there and I was like, how the heck is like, who is, what? like, how bad are the other places that this place is winning? <laughs> Just that my, my opinion. And I'm like that, it almost felt like it was an award for like, good, you know, congratulations for making people try really hard to balance a work and a life at the same time. I don't know. But yeah, so it was very prevalent in the news um, and kind of like as a mindset, it's like you want the work-life balance. Oh, for sure. And, you know, I, I know I saw those ads. I'm like, oh, why can't I achieve that? And, you know, there's definitely a couple of people, they achieve that. And, and I think my idea of work-life balance or what's portrayed in the media is quite different than what on individual basis. Um, but yeah, so I, I left UI because I wanted more work-life balance, but still wanted to be an accounting technical area. So I went to Alberta Securities Commission um, and that was during the whole IFRS transition. Um, I'm really dating myself, but that was kind of we, really big thing. We both are. It is, it is okay. <laughs> so now IFRS, everyone's like, that's what they're um, used to. But that was a big new thing that Canadian, going from Canadian Gap to IFRS uh, back in uh, 2010. So, so I 
so I was at the Alberta Securities Commission for about 10 years. So I was an um, analyst there looking at all the public company filings, not just financial statements, but MDNA, AIF, prospectuses, doing IPO, so going public. Um, and then I was a controller there as well, um, looking after their finances. Um, so yeah, so I, I really wanted my career to see all the things accounting can offer, right? Being an auditor, regulator, um, preparer, controller, and yeah, and see what I like. Cause I never really found what I really wanted to do. Like work was, oh, it was good, but it was never like, oh, this is what I wanted to do. Um, so I kept searching for something uh, within the accounting field to see what works for me, so. What's really great about what you just said, is, and I think it resonates with students and myself, both previously and even now to a certain extent is, you know, liking accounting, but not knowing exactly how we want to use it or potentially even use it, but, you know, not yet resonating with that thing that's like, this is me, like, this is it, but still working towards applying a skill set and, you know, making a good living, you know, working through and being rewarded in certain ways, but never quite, I guess, find, finding that place. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. And I think for um, kind of the students who are just starting kind of the career in accounting, yeah, like I, I think it's, I think it's just a start. Like I find accounting, I was kind of looking back what does CPA kind of mean to me? And it really gave me a good start. Uh, like I think having financial literacy is a life skill, right? It's gonna set you apart from so many um, things because you have to have that as a base to make good informed decisions. And and it's okay not knowing what, uh, what not to know what you know exactly because I, I, mean, I was always jealous or envious with people like they knew exactly what they wanted to do what they want to pursue and I've just never really knew that um, but you know I didn't want to admit that I guess because I feel like I, I'm failing and, and mm -hmm. you know it's hard to admit that you're failing at something so I just kept trying different things and accounting and CPA journey allowed me to have those opportunities to try things and, and make informed decisions. Um, so I, I would say for your students to keep trying and, and use accounting as a good base to start. So it's not a destination. It's not going to be end, uh, but really the beginning of their journey. Completely. Uh Absolutely. Uh, it's almost so Cal Newport, uh, he's written a couple different books. Uh, one of my favorite is so good. They can't ignore you where he really talks about using your twenties as a place to earn career capital. Um, and that capital you can use and invest in, uh, in different ways. And you might not know yet how that's going to play out, but you're at least building towards something. So when you speak about, uh, financial literacy, you know, Warren Buffett calls accounting the language of business for a reason and being able to pick up a set of financials, being able to open up a spreadsheet for the first time and have the tools and the confidence to figure it out. And if you can't figure it out on your own, knowing who to pull in, what questions to ask and what resources, that is, that is huge. And something I don't, I, sometimes now I take for granted, but then if you're right upon reflecting on our career path. It's like, yeah, that is something that I earned and something that brought me to, to where I am. So before we dig into what you're doing now, you did mention to me a little bit previously, uh, that you are, this is not your first podcast. Yeah, I just mentioned that I was a, I did a oh, guest thing for I was a like, friend. Elena, I have this awesome idea. Like, I would love for you to be on my podcast. And you're like, oh, I've done one of those before. Yeah, it was a really short, I have a colleague uh, that I sat on a board with, um, and he has his own podcast uh, called Off the Walk. I'll give a shout out, I guess, yeah. for, him, for him and his partner. Um, and uh, it's about... Um, uh, I guess, Asian Canadians um, talking about their uh, experience living in Canada, I guess, in, in terms of that. And yeah, and it was one of the episodes for about names, um, about how we came out with English name, because uh, obviously I'm Korean Canadian and um, Elena is the name I um, 
Nate, I gave myself when I came to Canada because no one could pronounce my Korean name and it just became really embarrassing for both sides. So, mm -hmm. so for the person who's trying to pronounce my name, because no, no one wants to butcher someone else's name because it's part of their identity and stuff. So it's just the struggle all my teachers had to go through uh, when I when I came here when I was when I was nine, so I was in grade four. So the poor teachers just trying to do their, their best to pronounce my name couldn't. And you know, as a nine year old, you're embarrassed because you know you don't, you have all that tension. Yeah. So um, so they suggest that I would get an English name just to make it easier for everything. So so I actually named myself. Um, I got that off off a cartoon because obviously I was watching cartoon at that age huh. and I just thought that name Elena was really pretty so it and it's not a very name. yeah it's not a very common name for Asian <laughs> descendant um uh, but yeah that's how where I got it um but really on that pat podcast I mentioned it's not really my name that I, I um I mentioned it was about my sister because I named my sister and my cousin as well <laughs> oh uh, uh, as a nine-year-old, but because um, in Korea, in Korea, um, your last name is actually your first name, so like they switched it around. So I would be Kim Elena instead of Elena Kim. Okay. Um, so at that time, I um, my sister and I was reading uh, mystery books, and Agatha Christie was really mm. popular um, then, and I mean, she's always, she's very obviously very legendary, and I thought Christie was the first name but it was actually a last name so my sister should have been Agatha Kim but she became Christy so <laughs> so she's and, and no no shade to Agatha's out there but is Christy happy with with this mix up yes she loved it because like you know Agatha is not a very it's an older yes, um, it's more traditional. <laughs> yes so yeah she's she's very thankful that I had that <laughs> mistake so yeah Okay, so I wanted to talk a bit about this because, um, you know, I am relatively notorious for being bad with names, all names, all names. Um, our international students' names are, um, you know, Canadian born students' names. And by the end of the year, I'm typically like doing good, but it takes me about a week. If you meet with me in person, I'll, I'll probably know your name, but if it's like, 40 kids and 40 students in a classroom. I'm like, Oh, Oh my gosh. Like there's a lot of stimulus there. So, um, I wanted to bring this up because some of our students have, um, uh, have decided to keep their, their names are international students. And some of them have decided to change their names. So I was really curious if you were entering university now, would you make the same decision or would you have kept your Korean name? as kind of your name I know you didn't you didn't discard it but do you know what I mean which which name would you use yeah no that's an interesting question so if I'm entering a university now um 2021 I guess um I I guess it really depends um you know obviously when I came here in the 90s it was uh, a lot harder right it was less inclusive and having ethnic name um, wasn't as common as you see now um, I would say that having English name like when do you ever get to choose your own name because you're born with that right so it's always nice to have that so as long as that you're able to do that with your own decision uh, I, um, and you could own it I think that'd be fine so I would still get an English name just because I know name is part of your identity, but I want to make it easier for people calling my name and then saying my name and obviously not for forgetting my where I came from and my traditions, but make it easier um, for both sides, simplifying things. I think mm. that I think I, I value that bit more than um, as long as like someone's not trying to take away my name or my right. heritage, yeah, like right? You're, you're using it as an empowerment tool. You're saying, I want this because of me similar to like, I, my name is, you know, Samantha Taylor and people are like, should it be professor Taylor? Should it be, you know, Samantha? Should it be? And I'm like, it is whatever you want, because as long as I feel like it's how you speak to me, it's how we interact. It's not what you say. It's how you say it is my personal view, but I, I am very cognizant that, um, you know, it's similar to, to pronouns. It's similar to names. Like I want to respect you. And I want, if somebody wants to, 
you know, be called by their, uh, by their given name? Absolutely. If somebody wants to be, you know, by a nickname or by a chosen name, absolutely. So like, thank you for, for sharing your perspective on it and the empowerment, right? That it's your choice. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and now that I, um, uh, I mean, we'll talk about what I'm doing now, but now that I also am um, teaching and I'm very sensitive about that because I went through that. So I always ask how they want to be addressed. Um, um, maybe they have a different name they want to be called, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I try my best to pronounce, but I, you know, we're not perfect. So as long as you have that underst mutual understanding and that respect, I think mm -hmm. that's all people want it, right? So completely. No, thank you. That's, uh, that's fabulous. And yeah, so you're teaching now. So I, I love this because we reconnected. It's not like um, you were my TA in university and I called, I, you know, I messaged you every month and I was like, you know, no, um, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we actually reconnected. Um, do you want to talk a bit about how we reconnected and then we can talk about what you're doing now? Yeah, you know, and um, so now uh, I'm a bit, I would call it freelancing accountant. Um, free spirit accountant. <laughs> free, yeah, so I tell people I have multiple part-time jobs. And one of the things I really wanted to do is uh, give back um, to the profession and um, my community. And so one of the things I thought that would be the best way to do that is teaching. Um, so I am a session instructor at University of Calgary, and I also do um, session leader at, at the CPA Western School of Business. And that's where Sam is involved with uh, quite intensively and she did the training for the new session leaders and I was like oh my goodness I haven't <laughs> seen Sam for 10 years or so and you're um you're leading our training and 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 you're also part of the uh, CPA National Marketing Center as well which I was marking um for Capstone too and and I saw that um you really uh, are being focused being an uh, educator um, and I saw you have your master so I was curious about how what your path was because you know I do see my I do have some educators in my network but not um, I guess not from going from uh, I guess industry to education so that is not as common transition so I was curious I reached out to Sam to see what her journey was. You wrote me the loveliest email um, and it's funny because I had also like we were both quite busy and I had seen your name in training and I was like, oh, Elena Kim. I wonder if that is the Elena Kim. And then for whatever reason, we did a couple other sessions and then we had our session. I just completely was like, oh, okay. Made note, didn't, you know, didn't register to go further. Um, and then um, you wrote me a lovely note um, to this, my CPA Canada email. And um, after I, after I wrote um, Caitlin's goodbye message and you wrote me the loveliest note and then said, you know, did you used to go by a different last name? Like your name is Lena and you shared a bit about what you were doing and asked for a little bit and then asked um, about my PME, my professional master of education. And we had a good exchange um, and then set up a Skype call. And then what I loved is like, we were chit chatting probably like a half hour just went by almost. <laughs> we were chit chatting like this. And I was like, oh shoot, like I have to go. Um, hey, I'm coming to Calgary in a little bit or something like that. And um, like, you want to meet up? And I'm like, okay, like, like, like let, let's message. And then we ended up messaging. And yeah, a couple months ago, you met up with me at my, one of my favorite places, the Panda Cook House. And it was great to, you know, chat with you again. Um, and I just feel like now that you are, you know, we're, we're playing in the same realm of items. And like you said, we both know a lot of people. And we both have like somewhat similar like backgrounds. Um, and so it's really nice to speak with like-minded individuals and get to know like, where is your path and how did it take you here? Um, and what have you been up to? So, so yeah. So tell me a bit about your, like, do you have an average day now that you're, uh, I'm going to call it a free spirit accountant. Um, and like, and like, I'm just so curious. You also mentioned financial literacy, so I'm going to make sure to come back to that. But what does, like, what does it look like? And what do people think? Like, what do these traditional accountants think about what you're doing? Yeah, so my typical day, I guess, to start is um, I, I have breakfast with my husband, which I never did before because um, I was so busy yeah. uh, 
you know, typically before, maybe I would do before and after just give some contrast. So before, yeah. you know, I would get up 6, 6.30, um, get to work by 7.30, 8, because I worked in downtown. Um, so it takes time to try to beat the traffic, try to get there early. And then I work all day, come home around 6 or 7, and then make dinner and, you know, just kind of do that five, five days and then Oh, wait, wait, no, no. Did you work after dinner, though? Um, I, I really try not to. Um, so that was one thing. But, okay. you know, with your emails? phone emails you do check it like I don't actually <laughs> sit down but you do, yeah you definitely check your emails to see anything right and yeah. and I, I but I was still thinking about work um and I think that's what, that's why I was always so tired uh, yeah. so on the weekend I'm supposed to recharge but I'm still thinking about the projects um different projects I'm on or uh, with staffing everything so I was constantly working all the time and I would say I'm recovering workaholic because uh, I you know I, I did really love to work um and it's something I choose to do but the work I think um um covered like majority of my time so yeah. And so now I really make intention to uh, have breakfast with my husband and then we work out together in the morning yes. and, and then, uh, and then I kind of start my day around eight thirty nine. So I do, um, so I don't really have a typical day other than having that workout and breakfast routine. And I do consulting uh, for small businesses and also with, um, uh, with the Calgary Board of Education. So, cause that's the system that I went through and I, I helped them with some consulting and then I do some teaching um, and, and I, so I also do marking, I guess. And, um, and whatever it comes out, I was invigilating for CFI a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so I just kind of take different opportunity that comes up, but like what's kind of steady is kind of my consulting, um, educating. And I also do volunteer work. Um, so I sit on a board for not for profit called diversity. So I've been in that board for about four years. Um, and I also uh, one of the area leaders for um, CP Canada uh, financial literacy program in Calgary. So, yes. so this, this was fascinating because this kind of, this allowed me to kind of see how all the other items kind of link together is your eyes lit up when you spoke about, um, about financial literacy and your contributions. So, sorry, you sit on, um, or sorry, you're the, the lead for CPA Canada. Can you talk just a bit more about that? Yeah, so I've been um, one of the um, area leaders for Calgary. So we oversee, I think there's about five or six of us in Calgary. So we oversee, I have about 60 volunteers I manage. Um, so we do free sessions to um, anyone who really wants it. So CPA has really great program, award-winning programs that um, it's free. So it, it covers from grade youngest as grade uh, three to four to seniors. It covers small businesses, um, um, new immigrants, um, and just covers a wide spectrum. And we do free sessions now, mostly virtually because of the COVID pandemic, but it really did in person. So yeah, so I, I've been really passionate about that. And I helped moderate uh, a session um, this year, um, just helping with small businesses. Uh, actually, it was last year. Um, just how do they recover from this um, yeah. disruption? So, um, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So, no typical day. You're a free spirit accountant. Would you say, are you able to turn off on weekends more easily? Yeah. And, and that's the beauty of. Uh, kind of choosing your own hours and of course there's certain set hours I'm committed to but you know I could um like this week um because the colors are changing because it's fall and I was able to go hike up at Nose Hill and just enjoy the afternoon and see some deer and it was which was really nice and so, certain weekends I do have to work when I have different contract work but typically I turn it off but if I work on the weekend then I take a couple of days off during the week so I'm able to manage my own schedule which is uh, such a privilege to have that freedom and flexibility to do that and I'm I'm, I, I'm always very grateful for uh, where I am being able to have that freedom. Um, Cause I found a lot of times when you're in that 
I guess, typical eight to four job, you feel like you're kind of stuck because you're very committed to be there. Um, so, uh, but you know, now that a lot of people can work from home to have that flexibility, but still like it carries over, right? You could log on any time, which could be a good thing and a curse because you're always constantly on. Um, but so you really need to set healthy boundaries to make sure what works for you and, um, and then um, and stick to it. Yes, absolutely. So it's really interesting. Oh, is, so over our Panacook breakfast, um, one of the projects that you told me that you picked up was contact tracing. You were like, <laughs> and I love this. Because like it has nothing like you don't need to be an accountant, you don't need to be a CA, CPA in order to do this. And yet um, you did it because and like, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're like, that it came up, I believe as a volunteer opportunity. And you're like, Oh, that sounds cool. I want to learn more about how they're doing that. That was your decision making process. Yeah, so they needed, um, so, you know, because during the waves, they were saying they're short of people helping with contact tracing, contact monitoring, and um, so it wasn't totally volunteer, but, you know, it was kind of a minimum wage job. Oh, well, sorry, I I guess I should have said um, cost recovery, (laughs) like what you made covered your gas or like cell phone bill, I'm not sure, but. um, Yeah, you're able to work from home um, to do that, and um, yeah, so I was able to, I wanted to help Alberta. But I was doing helping with the Saskatchewan uh, contact monitoring out uh, through um, Sets Canada and yeah, just to help out, like, because you know, I feel like, um, you know, like there's all this crisis happening, and like, what can I do, right? What can I do as a citizen, not just an accountant, take that away? And this is just a resident and citizen want to help others, so I, I wanted to do that, so I did that. Um, um, a couple of days a week and and it was just eye-opening to see what people are going through because sometimes um, when you're at home all the time with all the restrictions you don't know what's really happening and there's so much misinformation out there to, um, to see what's really going on and and seeing people who are ill and recovering from COVID and um, assuring them you know what kind of help they could get and resources available like I, I was just really eye-opening and I really enjoyed that experience um just helping people and in non accounting field. And it's kind of nice to have an opportunity to do that. Completely. So what I'm hearing from all of this is you worked hard to create career capital, not knowing how you were going to use it and not knowing kind of what the end goal is and possibly not knowing what the end goal is now, who knows, I'm not going to go there, but um, quite yet. But then, you know, realizing at different points, like, okay, this isn't necessarily where I want my energy to go. This isn't, you know, somehow somewhere from early twenties with the partnership dreams of big four to, you know, contact tracing during the middle of a pandemic. It was like, there's a bigger purpose out there for me. There's something else I want to contribute to. So it's not that you took a wrong path or anything, but you took the career capital that you earned and you decided to apply it in different ways. First at the Alberta Securities Commission and then um, as a free spirit accountant and slash world saver slash um, educator, right? Like it's, I just really want to show that I was having office hours with a student yesterday and this theme comes up again and again and they have more than one offer and they want to know which one to pick so that the rest of their life is set. And I'm like, honestly, A, there's no wrong choice. B, your life won't be set. (laughs) So it's like, they get like the let, they're like, yay, no wrong choice. And then I'm like, B, like you gotta, you know, work with focused intensity and then be honest enough to reassess. So I guess uh, to me, that's both empowering and freeing. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think that totally makes sense. And I, you'd be very kind with all that um, labeling, but I, I, you know, I feel like, I, you know, I try every day and, 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 and um, hope for the best, but yeah, like I think with your students, um, yeah, I think at that time, you know, you really want to move on and it's exciting. It, um, it's very good that your students have multiple offers. For me, I only had one offer actually. <laughs> so I took that one offer I had, um, but well, and, making- and honestly, and some don't have any, and I'm trying to tell them, especially that it's okay. There's, you know, going to be more recruiting sessions. There's going to be more opportunities. Like it's, if 
just continue to stay positive. So sorry, but I just want to, you know, it's, yeah. it's a big gamut out there and everybody's going to be okay. And, and I, if, you know, it feels like, yeah, like, you know, there's always, you want, of course you want to have choice of where you want to go, but sometimes having too many choices is not a good thing either. Cause when you don't know what you want, then you're like, and then you rethink about, oh, maybe I should went path A versus path B or C. Right. And, and I think for your student who has multiple offer, that's really great. And they should be really proud of themselves and really pick, um, look at the people who, the, who, she, uh, who he or she wants to work with. I would say that would be uh, one of the top thing to look for. Um, and for someone uh, who doesn't have offers, don't worry about that. Um, and I know it's hard, um, you know, and because for me, like I, I didn't really have a lot of connections. I found like some of my peer when I was going through university had so many different connections through their parents or just through network and they had all this multiple offers and I only had one and I was like oh my goodness you're like I got one (laughs) I'll just take the one offer I have and um and there I had friends who didn't have any offer and I feel bad but they're doing fantastic now like they have their own path that they have and I had uh, one of my really good friends and she uh, didn't go to, she wanted to go to uh, big four, but she didn't get an offer from big four. So you, she went to a smaller firm that wasn't as well known and she worked through the, um, that process there and um, she's a partner there and things always work out as long as you work hard and have good intentions and, um, and w- surround yourself with people you enjoy working with and you can learn from and things always tend to work out and and don't let um all these expectations of what success means for mm-hmm. others define what you mean what um what you find success means to you right able to bridge that gap but I understand it's hard when you're at that age because it's oh everything is so um it's new, you want to do well, and you have all these things you want to prove because you're, you're young. And um, so I think that's you have cool. energy and you have enthusiasm and you have the skill set. and, you know, and sometimes it doesn't feel fair or sometimes it, you know, feels overwhelming and like there's feelings. And what we're saying is not that your feelings are wrong. They aren't, but just saying it's going to, it's okay. Wherever you're at, it's okay. Cause we know yeah. all the people, um, you know, through all, all permutations and combinations. <laughs> and the ones that, you know, are the happiest, um, if that's like the goal is the one, are the ones that, you know, took the bumps, kept smiling, you know, did their best when they had an opportunity. And then, you know, eventually those, that variation works out. Oh, absolutely. And, 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 and I think you, I think this is a time to actually try things learn and fail of things and I, I think I had such a fear of failing mm. uh in my 20s um so I always took a safer path like that that would uh, give me a uh, higher probability of success instead of pursuing something I really liked or something that interests me or um give myself a shot or it didn't maybe didn't have enough confidence to believe that I could do it but um, so, but you have to go through that path to learn and, and until you go through it, you don't really realize all those things, all the lessons, I guess. No, completely. Uh, what's cool though, is like you said, going through it on your own. And then now, like there's probably people out there that are very critical of what both of us, like, cause we're, you know, same, same, similar, um, you know, are there any kind of well-intentioned people out there that maybe are questioning the career path that you're choosing right now? Oh, for sure. I think, um, you know, I, you know, it's kind of making my decision uh, of kind of leaving my comfortable, stable, secure job where, you know, I really enjoyed people I work with and they treated me really well. So they were very wondering what, um, why I made the decision to leave and try something different or uh, when I left uh, when they give my notice I didn't actually have a next job lined up so it was puzzling for people why you, you would do that right because that's not a typical path usually people leave because they secured a new opportunity um, so yeah they could get critical um, I you know I don't think anyone would bluntly tell you other no. than maybe you're no. friendly but it's very kind of micro more like indirect 
comments that you get is like, well, what are you doing now? Yeah. And then you tell them and they, they have no interest in what you're doing. They're like, well, why would you be doing that? <laughs> Um, well, what's next? And the reason I bring it up is in 2015, I quit my comfy industry job uh, with parking bonus, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I went to pure education consulting and people were flat out like, why? <laughs> or like, are you, some people were like, are you making enough money to eat? <laughs> and, and like, it was, I did get probably because I'm a little bit, I don't know maybe I invite a little bit more bluntness. Um, I felt like some, I felt some direct, direct shade at times. And then, um, I think the best, not revenge, but like just the best thing is to know why you're doing something. And then remember, remember you're getting up and you're having breakfast with your husband and you're working out with him and you are able to have the autonomy, right. And take that. And it's, also have the confidence that if you were like, you know what, I want to go back to that commute. I want to go back to, you know, um, thinking about work 24 seven. I don't want to hike, um, on a, on a Wednesday and see, you know, the beautiful deer and the wonderful weather, uh, fall weather. If you ever want to go quote back, if you ever want to kind of revisit, oftentimes somebody is able to, right. Uh, absolutely. I think, uh, and, and that's why you kind of talked about building your career capital or social capital, right? And um, if you treat everyone well throughout your career, and, um, you know, I think there's always opportunities there. And yeah, you know, I, I do think about at times, um, going back, uh, at times when, when things are, um, when I'm feeling insecure, or, or something's not working out the way I want it, right? Um, yeah, there's a maybe few seconds of that thought um and um but then I think about all the good things right so you really have to know exactly what you want because I think if you don't know then you'll def- uh, you'll definitely get um uh will likely go back because that's what you're comfortable uh you're um you know and, right it, and that's hard to break down. Miss, right exactly there's, there's a very um you know Lots of times people say, oh, they say, oh, they say, they say to do this. They say to go to a firm and um, it's actually funny. They say to go to a firm and stay till manager and then go to industry. Um, And I'm always like the, I'm the kind of anecdote, like, no, it's okay to leave before you find out about your letters. Um, But it's also good to say, yeah, this is, you know, you can stay and this is where it will bring you to. But there's just all of these paths and there's the one that is kind of right for you. Um, and reassessing and just choosing, yeah, not being kind of the social capital. Um, okay. So I'm going to hop around just a little bit because it almost naturally leads us to this question, um, that a student has asked me to do. And I love this one because it's definitely a little bit cheeky, but do you regret getting your CPA? I I don't think so. I think that's probably one decision I have no thoughts about having ever regrets not that I regret a lot of things anyways but um definitely not because it's like I said this um pursuing the CPA designation uh has opened so many doors for me and give me opportunities that I wouldn't necessarily have if I didn't have the designation um and allowed me to have the financial literacy as a base and able to meet great people on like you Sam and just a network and learn something and and I, I don't want people to think um, once they get the designation, they're done, right? And I think that's often the misconception people have is, and yeah. then once you get the designation, a lot of um, um, people are like, now what? What do I do? And mm. you kind of go through a, a bit of a mini crisis to figure what they want to do. So kind of see it as an, another step versus mm-hmm. like a destination. Um, but I definitely do not regret it. And I do highly recommend and I have heard that there's trends of less students um, majoring in accounting and kind of pursuing Um, just because you know I think there's a lot of talks about automation artificial Mm. intelligence a lot of the jobs will be eliminated and and obviously job is a top on top of Mm. everyone's mind as a um, as an undergrad student, um, but I think there's huge opportunities by getting the CPA designation is set you apart, right? And 
uh, and having those enabling skills, I think that's what CPA calls it. I call it pervasive skills, but um, yeah. <laughs> yes, you, so. you know, the legacy CAs <laughs> when they use things like indicators and pervasive skills. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Just to having communi- good communication skills, able to lead and, and just able to um, kind of see like problem solve. I think that's really huge. Um, I think that'll never be replaced by AI or automation is because you're able to ha- take multiple um, factors and able to have um, recommendation to, ma- for, to make a decision or to um, for um, help decision makers to make those decisions. So I think that will be more critical than ever um, and CPA um, path or their program does help set a good foundation for that. Completely. Um, we are, we actually want more automation. We want, um, I have, you know, I was just texting with my friend who's also a CPACA um, about the future of accounting education and what employers want from students. And it's, you know, yes, more of that, how to use AI, uh, how to understand what do the numbers mean, how to, you know, when the program spits out numbers, being able to communicate the so what. Uh, and even last year, or sorry, last week I was in a seminar and they didn't speak about accounting specifically, but they talked about whether or not, like how they thought out the findings were that humans don't like when machines make moral decisions. So they don't want the machine saying who lives and who dies. They don't want the machine saying, okay, this is how much of your cancer we cut out. Um, And I could very, very, you know, see a straight line between, you know, they don't want to know what your investing advice is. We've seen it with robo advisors. You know, they came out what, like eight years ago and yet they're almost becoming, they're like a fad and now they're kind of shrinking out because it's like, we want that human connection. Um, and especially in the last 18 months, it's been more and more prevalent. You know, we want the humans to leverage the data and communicate the data and tell the story. And we want the accountants to utilize the machines, um, identify, the stuff going in, what are the errors, identify how to fix them and understand how to communicate the story of a business coming out. So I, I really do see it just as, as tellers or for me as bank machines didn't replace, you know, the, the need for financial institutions, uh, brick and mortar. I don't see, I don't see accountants being eliminated. I feel like CPAs are being elevated and it's a very exciting you know, place to be as part of a contributing member to the education, I think. And absolutely. And I think we need to do a better job as a profession to promote that. Because I think uh, the other side is actually being very more apparent than, um, what, you know, what we just talked about is how, how it, it, needs, uh, it will be elevated. It is. And I see it. Um, uh, but we need to do a better job of communicating and getting the right information out there for the students. So then they do get inspired to pursue a career in accounting. And then hopefully nobody ever has to spend a weekend footing financial statements. Right, Elena? <laughs> like, yeah. if, I, if I could do that, I could like shave off, a, like, or I could add an extra year to my life. <laughs> yeah, all well, the green and red pens, yes. Oh, <laughs> PTSD. Okay, uh, let's get into some fun stuff. So any books or podcast recommendations you have for students or recent grads, they can be business related. They can be fun. They can be like, we had somebody on here that loves um, true crime. (laughs) You know, I've been reading quite a bit, you know, before I used to not read as a a student, because you read a lot of textbooks. And I'm like, oh, and you read a lot of uh, different standards uh, through CPA. And um, I I have two books, actually, I would recommend. Um, first one is called The Courage to be Disliked um, mm-hmm. by Fumite Tatake, Koga, and Ichira Kishimi. So it's a Japanese um, authors. I don't know if you heard of that, but... I'm not. Yeah, so it was huge. It was very popular in Asia. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's really important for students or, or um, recent grads who are entering the career to... Um, to be okay to feel uncomfortable and have the courage um, to do what they want. Cause I think a lot of times at that, um, in your kind of twenties, um, you, there's a lot of expectations uh, placed on you from your, uh, pr- your profs, uh, your family, your friends, your peers. And, and 
And if you could think that if you could be free to be truly be yourself and and able to choose happiness and and choose that for yourself instead of relying on something or someone and and you know being free from um, they call it the shackles of the past trauma and expectation of others. So it kind of gives you a good perspective, and it's not a lecturing. It, so it's uh, the book is set up as a conversation between a philosopher and a student and uh, going through different discussions about um, how to be free and having that courage to pursue what you want. So that is, I am taking notes. I will be reading <laughs> this one. Thank you. Yeah, I wish I read that when I was then. So that's why I thought it'd be a good book. And um it's just something, another perspective to see and having that courage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, oh, sorry, I had another one. So the second one is called Grit uh, by um, The Power of Passion and Perseverance by Angela Duckworth. Um, mm-hmm. And it talks about, and I, I personally always wonder about what makes people uh, be successful. Like what are the successful people doing differently than than me, I guess. And um, and. Um, so it kind of gives you evidence based on based on research about different stories and calling this the grit factor mm-hmm. and, and having the perseverance to fight through. Um, so I thought it was a really good uh, book to for students to read. And I'm going to push back on that a little bit because you said um, what what you wish you would have done or something like that. You said something and when you looked right. I was like, no, because I I don't know. I feel like um, knowing what I know about your you know, our, our collective work experience, um, and you made it further than I did. Um, I feel like that is grit, right. In a lot of ways. And I feel like, um, a number of times during your career, you have displayed, uh, what grit is. So I just want to dig in there a little bit. Uh, and it's, I know it's so difficult talking about ourselves because, um, but, but we're here and, it's good to be open and honest about even the bad stuff. I know the diff- the hard stuff is when we say like, oh, this is what I did well, or this is what I'm proud of, right? But then owning that and then, you know, having the humility to be like, okay, and here are things that I wish I would have done. So the research-based um, evidence uh, and as well as com- uh, pairing with the anecdotes that Angela Duckworth speaks about in grit. Can you give us like just a little glimpse um, because I am familiar and she has a TED talk. So if nobody wants to read the book, Yes. Read the book, but also there's a TED talk. So what did they find? What was the differentiating factor for the successful people? I mean, she goes to variety, but I think it's just having, um, just, you know, cause I think it's a lot of people think that um, you're born with it. You have that talent, mm-hmm. but the great factor is really more about kind of sticking it through. So th- they say in research that um, when, uh, for example, if you're part of the sports team, and you do it year after year um, instead of like, cause you can, it's going to be hard, right? Maybe you don't have physical skill set or, but if you keep coming back and keep trying and keep pursuing what you uh, like doing, um, eventually you will be successful. Uh, it's a matter of fighting that through. And, and I, and so one thing I really liked about it is like um, with hiring, uh, when you're hiring people, how do you find like, good person or the right fit and the one thing you could definitely look for is that how long have they stuck stuck through like sometimes you don't want someone who just stuck through forever either but have they come at least year after year and because over that experience you'll learn something but sometimes if you only do it for one time or just twice or something it may not you know they may not have gone through the whole process so look for the patterns of people that are able to stick it through um, and able to learn something from that experience and it'll help people um, kind of have that success factor. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, It reminds me of somebody that we worked with at the firm and for obvious reasons, I'm not going to name names, um, but they were unsuccessful on the CP or on the UV um, three times which meant they were re- deregistered from the program. Um, and this is a person that if it were ever between her or me to be hired for something, it's her. It's all day, every day, her. But for, you know, for some reason, she couldn't pass this exam. 
Um, so they offered to move her to New York to take the U.S. Uh, exam and then do the reciprocity, um, you know, as an option. They offered to, um, you know, send her to uh, Ontario where they could do some fast track through some of the modules there and then come back because, you know, uh, the, the place she was working recognized her value uh, and wanted to keep her on. They just had to pass this like hurdle of this designation. She chose to go through the program again. So the CA program, like the capacity that we're teaching in, she did the modules alongside her staff. So she had the humility to, like I'm getting goosebumps, to go alongside her staff. She worked through busy season as a manager because she needed to get this done. Um, she took the UP and I bawled my eyes out when I found out she had passed because there are there are those people out there that are nice, that champion other people and that, you know, have a roadblock and it's a more pervasive roadblock. And when they, you know, demonstrate that grit and succeed, like just, just so, so, so incredible. And, you know, I'm sure that she had doubt, but she, she showed up and she did her best and, um, and it worked out and, I don't know about you, but I, I just knew at that moment that she would be, you can't help but be a better leader. You were more compassionate, you were more understanding and, um, and, and you're really able to kind of own that process and then share that with the others and lift others around you up. So she didn't give up on her goals. So when I hear you speak of grit, I automatically think of this person. Yeah, no, that's great. I, and we all have examples of someone who portrays that. And I think, yeah, I think that's the showing up and able to live that experience and overcoming those challenges, right? And I think that to me um, it, is more valuable than someone who could just be really smart or intelligent. Um, having that uh, like the humility in lived experience and they will be more compassionate and be a better leader because they've gone through that and able to uh, relate with others and and I think that's a lot of things sometimes is missing because a lot of the leaders I've seen are they never had too many failures in their process so uh, the expectations becomes really unrealistic um, and not able to relate with um, their staff or you know someone who maybe are not as far along um, but I think our leaders definitely need to have that experience um, to um, to connect and engage people otherwise um it it becomes the gap gets bigger absolutely absolutely all righty so i am so interested to hear after this discussion after you know getting reacquainted with you and yeah just every time loving our conversations i am just so curious to know how Elena Kim defines success? You know, this, uh, yeah, you've been asking me a lot of tough questions. And I have, this is, <laughs> this is what I'm here for. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm sure the tables will be turned someday. <laughs> so I think my definition of success has definitely has changed over, um, drastically actually over time. And I think in my twenties, I definitely thought my definition of success was, that you know you had a lot of money, a lot of power, and a lot of influence. Um, to me, at this point of time, um, success means that I'm I'm able to be myself mm-hmm. and being okay being myself and and living the happy, healthy, and fulfilled life. And and to me, like it's going to be really important for each person to define their own success. So I think it's a really good question uh, and a tough one because a lot of times you don't know what it means because often you get, you define things based on what you see or uh, what's what's around you. Um, so there isn't one definition. So that's what I really want everyone to know. But until they go through that, I think it's really hard to uh, grasp, that, grasp, that, grasp that knowledge and um, and so just find what you believe in and, and definition of success will change uh, over time and be okay with that. I love it. I love it. My, my own definition of success, every time I hear uh, somebody share theirs, it gets shifted a little bit in, in a good way, right? Um, and I haven't yet quite nailed that down. And I 
don't think I ever want it to, if that makes sense. I want to continue learning and growing and having different perspectives and, um, and just interacting and being out in the world and trying and failing and trying and learning and watching others learn and grow. So yeah, um, I can completely resonate. I think that's fantastic advice. And it's so neat to kind of reconnect after so many years. And you bought me Panacook. We almost had a bill fight. You are such a sweetheart. We had an amazing, amazing um, breakfast and Panacook. And I am really looking forward to, you know, possibly collaborating on a project, um, a mutually interesting um, project with you sometime in the future. And in the meantime, I am grateful to you uh, for reaching out and to agreeing to being on this podcast. And yeah, um, just want to say thank you. And um, if my students want to reach out, are they, are they able to somewhere? Yeah, they could uh, send me an email. And, you know, I think it's fantastic. And I think uh, Sam, you're doing such a great innovative work as an educator, because I think a lot of times we get stuck in the traditional path of education and having this different podcast, giving a different medium for students to learn and learn about uh, what, what it's like. I think it's fantastic. So uh, yeah, definitely I can reach out and happy. Uh, they're very lucky to have you as your as their uh, professor. And, uh, and I want them to keep getting inspired. And, and I think they made a fantastic decision to pursue uh, a career in accounting and they can never go wrong uh, with that. So I concur. Thank you, Lena. Thanks.